This is a presentation about the building and firing of the Rosinante kiln, which is our smaller kiln that has beautiful results in a three-day firing. It's a smokeless Bori box Anagama hybrid, and we'll break down what all that means in these first few slides. So here's the uh, kiln as it stands now, and uh, as I said, it's a smokeless hybrid Anagama Bori box. So what that means really is that uh, as we look at the three components that make up this kiln, this is the Bury box. This is a special kind of uh, firing uh, approach. This fire box originated in France and is called the Bury box because a Monsieur Bory didn't invent it, but he was the first one to actually put it down in writing, to actually observe and write about it. So um, the Bory box, you throw wood in the top of this um, box, and because the chimney is so tall, it had, creates a tremendous draft and pulls the fire down and through the wear chamber. Now here's the area below the grate. Here's the, where the grate is inside the kiln, and there's a quite a large area for that. And then this is all the wear chamber. In the book Japanese Wood Fired Ceramics, the fourth chapter covers the building of the Saskine smokeless kiln. And it is equivalent of um, the area that you see with the door, but it doesn't have a shaped uh, top that is in the shape of an onagama form, and it doesn't taper, it, doesn't, it isn't so long. This is about twice as long as the chamber in the Saskine smokeless kiln, but it is smokeless, and that comes about because of this third component, which is the very tall chimney. The combination of a really large, super efficient firebox for a relatively small wear chamber and a very tall chimney creates a very efficient burn and makes the kiln smokeless. So there's the relatively small size of the wear chamber compared to the Bury box. And a, and a tall chimney for the size of the kiln. The chimney is about six meters. You can see that the grate is there, and you'll, I'll show you pictures of the grate soon, and that is actually a very um, important part of the design because um, we use the underside of the firebox to load um, pieces that will only show any real results, really um, nice results from the firing, if um, they get hot enough before the embers fall through grates. So that's the advantage of the grate. If you make it the right grate, it'll keep the wood burning and not falling too much down on the pieces until the pieces have gotten hot enough. Here's another view of the kiln. You can see that the chimney is quite tall. That's a six meter chimney. And of course we have a pizza oven. So in chapter four of Japanese wood-fired ceramics, you can see a uh, bit of this described. And here's an image of the, uh, this is, uh, I'm gonna show you the differences. This is a diagram of the Saskine smokeless kiln. Um, so the differences are that the wear chamber that we have created for our Rosinante kiln is more the shape of a kind of banana slug or an anagama shaped kiln versus this, which is a kind of a, just a, an arch. It is an arch over the wear chamber. Also, our chamber is about twice as long as this. Um, we have created a much larger ember chamber to take advantage of some of the very special effects you can get underneath the firebox. Um, and in the flue section, instead of doing this, uh, this uh, post and lentil approach to a flue construction, we have actually built um, an arch for a fire mouth. Here, as you're looking at a picture of the Rosinante kiln in construction, what you can see is the into the uh, firebox, and you can see the grates are actually two and a half inches um, space between each of the grates, which is an ideal. Uh, amount of space because it it um, allows for plenty of oxygen but uh, inhibits the dropping of embers too quickly so we get very good um, heat down below before we start burying um, our special effects pieces in the falling embers from the burning wood uh, and so instead of what what this design typically calls for is what is called hobs 
which would be ledges on both sides, no, no grade at all, just an empty space. And then there'd be ledges and the wood would be cut exactly the length of the space so you could drop it in and it would be held up on these ledges. We're not doing that here. We're creating this grate and that gives us, that gives us several advantages. Another advantage of the grate is we can burn any kind of wood we get. We don't have to have a specifically sized wood for burning. Here, we're going to look at the nine zones of Johan in this kiln, and this is similar to um, the presentation that you s will see on the Saskane kiln that we're firing currently in Sidiria, uh, Sidiria in uh, Portugal. And so um, these are the side stoke areas right here, and that's the bag wall, plays an important part of directing the flame through the chamber. And here is the hikidashi door, and you'll see that in action in a little bit. Now, A is a very special part. It's at the very back outside wall of the firebox below the firebox in the ember pit. And that's a place you can load pieces that are already fired, high, high fire cone 10 glaze. And this will change the quality, the, the colors and textures of those pieces. B uh, represents the uh, area just out, just before the flame goes out of the uh, ember pit and into uh, the wear chamber through the, the flue, and you'll see pictures of that in a moment. C is actually within, inside the flue itself, and uh, that has, these are both B and C and D to come here. These are areas that have intensive ash um, impact, uh, and then starting at B, it's quite a bit of ember. C, it's medium, moderate um, ember buildup around the piece, and D, it's it's a small amount of ember buildup. But everything that is sticking out of the embers has a tremendous ash uh, accumulation and uh, erosion, lots of erosion. So E is the shelf stacks right in front of the area D, which has to be left open. And uh, those shelf stacks uh, often produce beautiful works of natural ash glaze. Um, F is uh, the top shelves, the shelves that go all along the top of the kiln. And those are exciting in that that's the direction of the flame. So the flame carries lots of ash and lots of um, uh, vaporized uh, material from the flames. So you get uh, lots of flame marking and lots of ash along F. G is the back stack of, um, of shelves, and because it's behind the bag wall, um, it doesn't get as much ash, except for anything it picks up from the side stoke. And it is a great place to put glazed ware, things that have, have been glazed and you want to melt glaze on them. Um, and then this last area here, which is um, quite a bit of extension of the kiln, we can do some significant tumble stacking, and I'll show you what that looks like. Here is the A section. This is where uh, we're loading already fired um, bowls um, that have been fired with other glazes. So the cone 10 glaze fired stoneware is loaded against the back wall of the firebox. During the firing, this area will get hot enough to remelt the glaze before the pieces are buried and insulated by falling embers. The embers, the ember shroud will create the sangari effect of micro reduction atmospheres over the, each piece. So the little, um, the little embers, some touch the piece, some create little pockets. So it goes from uh, little, little spots of heavy reduction to mild reduction. And here's an after-firing shot of, you can see to the left, some pieces that were in the B section right before the fire mouth, right before um, leaving the firebox. And on the right, you can see these pieces that were loaded and how many you can knock over or lose during the process. Those are the bowls that you saw pictured earlier. Here's a, a result. These are, this is an image of a bowl fired in this kiln. And this is a Oribe and iron ink, uh, iron uh, wash, uh, Oribe style bowl that was then refired in this technique. Here is an example of both the conge from the embers uh, building up around the pot and the intense ash and some erosion. Here, if you look at those two tall vases, I'm going to show them to you finished. And you can see they're just inside the fire mouth inside the um, 
the ash pit, the ember pit. And here is one of those pieces you just looked at. And here is the other tall vase that you saw in that picture. This is a piece that was fired in the first firing of the Rosinante Kiln when we began to discover that we had created quite um, an amazing amount of ash generation in this style of firing. Um, and so this piece has been on exhibition. I've seen it in exhibition. Here's one at the Davis Art Center. It's gotten around. And this is an interesting image. This is a, a head sculpture that I did of um, in, and this was fired right in the center of the ash pit, uh, the ember pit. Um, so this was not by the fire mouth, but in the center. And much of what you're seeing is a tremendous amount of erosion. The, what happens is the ash comes down um, at high temperature and it, it combines with the silica to make glass. And if it keeps doing it, then that glass gets builds up and rip, drips off the piece. So that's what's happened here. Uh, all of this clay just got um, washed away. And here are some pieces that are loaded. You'll, you're going to see a picture of that mask and of that um, uh, pitcher right there, that bird-beaked pitcher coming up. Here's the mask. Here's another mask. Both of these fired in that same spot. And here's the bird beak picture, and here it is cleaned up. So you can see a remarkable amount of color from this. And this is a piece that was fired just outside of the firebox, uh, of the fire mouth. And these gouges that you see, these really deeply carved gouges, they weren't there when it went into the kiln. And you can see here how sharp this edge is. That's because all of this was eaten away. Um, all of it was eaten away by um, the by the ash coming down and raining down and just eating, turning the silica into glass and it dripping off. And you get these deep gouges and these grooves because the, the liquid, liquefied silica that turns the glass will follow the line of re least resistance. And there might be some grog or something that keeps it from going one direction. And it repeats that path and starts to carve a groove. Here, these were quite soft and round before they got eaten up by the ash process. Here's a top view, so you can really see the whole piece had the soft round edge, all like this. But as you can see, the part facing into the firing was uh, truly compromised, truly eaten away, eroded. This is the erosion effect. Um, and um, just a stunningly beautiful piece. Here's a piece that was fired right behind it, but was, so, was just far enough out of the uh, erosion zone. This piece was not far out of the erosion zone, and this was a piece we didn't realize was going to get so eaten up, but uh, just a, an accidentally gorgeous piece that is not nearly as functional as perhaps it might have been. Here's another piece that was fired just behind that, and no, very little um, erosion happening there. So here's a kiln load. And I would have you note a few things. One is the straight up stance of this piece and this um, little pot sitting right on that brick. And after the firing, you can see we've had some movement. Um, the pot that was on this brick is now down here. It has fallen down. And you can see that this figure has, has really moved. There's, there's where the pot used to be. And you can see the, that pot leaning forward, or that sculpture leaning forward quite a bit. And you can see another mask in that position. Here's some uh, paintings that I fired in the Rosinante kiln. And this is the figure. This is called La Liberté, based after the uh, Delacroix painting of Liberty leading the people. Here's a look of in on the uh, load of the Rosinante kiln, and you'll see a couple of principles that are very important. One is that this front zone needs to remain open. If, it, if you load in here, it will block the ash from the rest of the kiln. 
So you have to keep this section open. And then you, but you can put things low, low forms on the on the floor if they're thick enough, because that's where all the erosion happens. The erosion happens here in the fire mouth and just inside of the firebox. So um, that's what's uh, going on here. Here we are looking at the outside of the kiln again. Uh, an emphasis of the placement of the bag wall. So the the wood goes in here; it burns downward, goes through the fire mouth, being pulled by the chimney. And then the bag wall forces the flame up, and then it goes back down again towards the exit flue. That's how it works. So, get a sense of the shelf building here. This is the way we built the shelves, put the shelves in in this last firing. And this is called Udamari, which is a, a a sea or ocean of green, of ocean of green ash. And in order to be Udamari, it has to be clear, not all clouded up with crystals. So this is an example of Udamari. And this happens on the first shelf above the floor uh, in front of the fire arch, but, um, but it has to be, it's never the first pieces on the shelf. It's the ones, the second ones just behind it. Here's another piece from that zone. And these are small porcelain vases by um, uh, Robin Brackle. So just to go back here, this is a nice loading technique. Um, I think on this, in this case, I loaded it on, I may have loaded this on um, seashells, but upside down on a brick gives you this advantage of two things. One is you get lovely color on the outside as most of the ash falls on the outside of the piece, but it also gets on the inside. And this actually was not with seashells. This was just a three point stand, as you can see, and beautiful color. In a range of color. This rabbit form, which is using two different colored clays, was on the top shelf, but uh, about two-thirds back in the chamber, so well beyond the bag wall. Here's the bag wall, and here you can see this is above the bag wall. We get lots of ash coming in here because it's not blocked at all by the bag wall. Bag wall has some gaps and allows some ash through, but also what you've got here is two side stoke areas. Um, right one here and one here. We have since uh, changed in favor of doing one big tall side stoke area. These are pieces that were fired on top of the shelf. I go back a little bit, it was a little fast. So these were fired on top of the shelf and as you can see in this big vase here, it was fired on a big round wad. Um, it was leaning on that one wad. These are small hanging vases that were fired um, on the floor of the side stoke firebox. So they get hit with a lot of wood, literally hit, and so they have to be very stably um, wadded. And um, you can see that they were fired on their, on their side, so you can see the horizontal ash that is typical of that. And these are interesting, beautiful colors that you get. Uh, most of it is a smoky black brown, but those colors, those reds and oranges, um, only to appear on the bottom of the piece. Here's another hanging flower vase. And you can see you get quite a bit of work in this kiln. This is, this is before the bag wall is put up. And this is... Um, Oni Temaku. Oni is the word for demon Temaku. And um, it's called demon Temaku because in the traditional way of doing things, these would be put in a sagger, and the sagger would keep it um, completely away from ash, and the results would be a very beautiful, deep, rich black with some brown breaking on the edges. But in this case, you get these incredible uh, rabbit's fur lines of gold 
um, and you can see it here as well, as well as some crystalline gold spots. It's really quite a, in some blushing, uh, glowing gold in contrast with the black brown. It's really a, an amazing effect that the Temeku glaze has. And that only happens in the very backs of, of the shelf stacks. Um, it gets too inundated with ash if it's further up. And here's some um, uh, Shino glazed pieces also. benefiting from the firing. And here is the loading starting. And we do cover the floor uh, with a kind of material. Here you can see uh, this, it's a, we, we cover it with uh, now with clay tiles to try and protect the floor somewhat from the heavy ash buildup that occurs. You can see in the, sm in the left corner here or the left side there's a um, refire piece, something that's going in for a second firing. And then you've got some other pieces in place here. You'll, I'll show you the finished piece of this in a minute. A uh, big vase there. Um, and this is the tumble stack area where we don't use shelves. We just pile large pieces one on top of the other. And here are some of the results from that area. Um, it's harder to see this, but it's easier to see this. This is, was that piece I told you I would show you that was in the back right corner of that area. And here's another piece. This was fi the furthest back in the kiln. This was just before the exit flew. So that is an example of a fine piece. And this, these were all fired in the tumble stack area as well. Those are, these are sculptures by Muna Halaby, the Jordanian sculptor. So this is the hikidashi window. And I'll show you about that. Hikidashi means pull, uh, pull out and dunk in water. Hikidashi. And um, that's exactly what we do. We reach in with uh, tongs, well protected, and we pull the piece out very hot. Now it's got a special glaze on it, which consists of one part iron oxide and two parts um, wood ash by volume. And so it actually gets so much iron in it that it's mildly magnetic. Um, and uh, this piece is going to be dunked in water And here's an example of a hikidashi piece. So when we were building the kiln, we started with a foundation and someone came up with the idea of writing solid foundation. But it, it is um, all, um, you wanna be careful. You can't build a kiln like this on a, um, on a slab of concrete unless there's about three or four layers of brick protecting it and that gets quite expensive. The um, the maintenance people when or the the builders when they remodeled our campus even though i asked them not to put any cement down there put a big chunk of cement so we had to get a special order to have them cut out that cement again and then we filled it in with brick and here it is uh, bricked in with the second layer of brick on and now we're laying out the actual um, outline of the kiln and what we're going by is we we have a depth of about 40 inches which allows us to put uh, very comfortably two 12 by 24 shelves in or one uh, or two 18 by 18 shelves I think is what we load with. And now we're getting ready to spring the arch that is going to be the fire mouth and the arch that's going to be the door. You can see there's the here we're making an arch and here we've made the arch and we're very proud of ourselves. So there was some work uh, involved in um, getting the arch in the right order and that because we had a miscellaneous collection of wedged bricks that we wanted to use to create a strong arch. And we didn't have uh, specific bricks we purchased to fit that arch. So we, we played mix and match them and then we labeled them. This is Lisa Jeton labeling our arch for us. And here's some happy campers once we got the arch up. There's something magnificent when you pull that, that support form out and, um, and the arch holds its own and it's quite strong. In this case, um, that arch um, becomes the doorway into the kiln. Here we're looking uh, past the uh, fire box. You can still see down below the, in both cases, in the arch that's the doorway and the arch that's the fire mouth, 
um, the arch supports are still in. Here you can see us building the fire grate for the uh, brewery box. Building up the kiln. The kiln actually narrows down to exactly the size of that exit flue, which is 10 by 20 inches. So you can see it from here how the kiln narrows to that exit flue. You can also see the um, the grate now, a little better view of the grate. And now we're looking from the wear chamber into the firebox. Some happy campers as we're building the kiln. And this is uh, the arch we used for the pizza oven that goes on top. And after you have the, build, the kiln build, and after you've put it in place, you need to get some steel architecture up. It, it, uh, all kilns need buttressing, and those kilns that are um, freestanding like this really need to be held together. And at the same time, you need the kiln to be able to expand with heat. So you'll see that all of these are bolted. There's separate sections that are held together by uh, steel shafts, threaded steel shafts with a spring in the bolt. The next step um, is kind of interesting. We start by putting, I, let's see if there's an example here. Yeah, you can see this wonderful structure here of uh, stilts and um, you've got some uh, plywood and that goes all the way up. It follows the, the uh, finished walls and then we start putting damp sand in place and then we sculpt the inside of the roof that we're trying to achieve. Once we have that, then we cover it with plastic and we start to mix refractory, which is a castable brick. And as we mix it, we just pile it on and move backwards. So we just pile it on and pile it on. And when you're done, you have to cover it with damp towels and plastic for at least 24 hours or maybe more. And this is the noble crew that hung in till the very end. That's Robin Brackle, the amazing Robin Brackle, sculptor extraordinaire. And Lisa Jatone, also a fine artist of note, all doing the, the pose there. And this is how we were feeling. And there we are. There's the kiln again. We're looking at the finished product. It's uh, all done there. And we have some fun. There's some serious pizza making going on every time we fire. Um, and this is a rather dramatic shot of me throwing pizza dough in the air. And the only time I actually do that is when someone's taking a picture. So there you go. Here's the pizza oven in action. And here's my daughter um, quite a few years ago. Uh, helping maintain the fire on our other pizza oven. This pizza oven is much more convenient to use. It's a better design and it's also uh, it's waist level or, or chest level so you can easily load and unload pizzas rather than getting up on a stool as the previous pizza oven requires. So that is the presentation on the building and firing of the Rosinante Kiln.